But welcome here, and we're going to be looking at some things in Romans, in the book of Romans. We're up to chapter 15, and let's start with a couple verses for contrast, and then we'll get into the study. First of all, uh, Romans, and I'll try to get them posted here so you can visually see the difference. Uh, Romans 15, verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And then you go down eight verses further, Romans fifteen sixteen, that I, that's Paul talking, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So he says, I should be, I should be the minister of uh, Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Now, as you recall, Jesus, in verse 8, he was a minister of the circumcision. He, the Father, sent him to his own people, and he in turn said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. He sent his disciples and apostles to Israel and said they wouldn't get out of Israel before he came back. Wouldn't get out of, of preaching that gospel, the gospel that the kingdom was there, was available. Was, he was the king, ready to take over if the people would, would uh, believe him believe who he was. That's the issue of the gospel of God. Believing the name of God, the name of Jesus, that he was the son of God. The Messiah. Risen from the dead. So you can see the difference in conditions there required uh, in, in Christ's earthly ministry in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There were differing conditions from uh, from when Christ returned to save Paul on the road to Damascus and, and reveal our gospel and doctrine to Paul. Our doctrine, that's... <laughs> when you understand that Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John came to the circumcision, preached to the circumcision, offered the gospel to the circumcision, and we're not the circumcision, it's... It's mar remarkable that the Lord came back to save Paul and to give him our doctrine, the doctrine for people believing the gospel of Christ, the gospel of the grace of God into the body of Christ, which is different. Uh, Israel had fallen before the body of Christ was started uh, by Christ saving Paul. That word acceptable, it says uh, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable. Uh, the, the word, the term is different than before being acceptable. Uh, they were only acceptable before by blessing Israel, Genesis 12.3. That was the Gentiles opening their way to come to God. For centuries before Jesus came and, and Paul was saved um, shortly after Jesus returned to heaven. They were only acceptable by blessing Israel, coming to God through Israel's covenants. And that's why they came to the synagogues. That's why the term the Gentiles in, in Romans 11.11, 11, that referred to the particular Gentiles that had come to the synagogues and were in a position to provoke Israel to jealousy, as prophesied. That, well, it was prophesied um, in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 32, 21. But the mystery that God used to fulfill that prophecy, that mystery was kept secret since the world began all the way up until it was revealed to Paul in Acts, after Acts 8. It's now made manifest, though. Now, things are different from Israel's conditions. Uh, we're saved by 
by coming directly to God through the gospel of salvation that that the Lord has given us, written down, he signed it, <laughs> uh, put it into writing in the Bible. Um, don't think the Bible is too big, too long, too hard to understand. It's God's message to you to keep you, uh, to give you life. We're born dead in trespasses and sins. We need the life of God. So um, we, we're saved by coming directly to God through Paul's gospel of salvation after believing who Jesus is, believing the gospel of God. Just like the Greeks and just like the Jewish remnant according to the election of grace, ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. The gospel of God is not a gospel of salvation. That's the gospel of the grace of God. That's the gospel of salvation. The gospel of God, when those Jews believed it, it completed the list of required things that, that was required of Israelites, such as circumcision, Genesis 17.10, obedience, Exodus 19, verse 5. Keeping the covenant, Genesis 17, 9. Keeping the commandments, Exodus 20, verse 6. Keeping the Sabbath. This is all parts of what Israel had to do. And they had to have faith. That's where they failed, wasn't it? Uh, according to Romans 9, 30 to 33. And uh, Romans 10, 1 to 10, um, they did not have that faith that they that the Lord required of them, and they didn't endure to the end. They <laughs> they didn't have the faith to endure. The gospel of God is not a gospel of salvation, but believing it made the Gentiles acceptable to hear and believe the gospel of Christ. That was a salvation gospel. And that's the name of it, the gospel of Christ, during a dispensation of the gospel. Let's look uh, elsewhere for a minute, and uh, I think we'll see some insights for Romans 8. Um, Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. Titus. But after the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared toward man word man appeared uh, that was on the road to Damascus that it appeared the, the God's kindness and love appeared according to Galatians 1 verses 11 and 12 he goes on he says uh, after that the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared toward man appeared not by works of righteousness which we have done not it doesn't say not by righteousness, but it's not by works of righteousness. Our works of righteousness. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy. He saved us by washing. The washing and cleansing from unrighteousness. The washing, it says here that the Holy Ghost did it. It was by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly it was his doing he shed the righteousness the regeneration the renewing on us and the resurrection his resurrection uh, he shed on us his Im it was his imputing it to us that makes it ours. Why we can claim it. Uh, it's not any good that we do. Any at all. Not any. It's not of our works. It's his works. And uh, he presented those works to us. Imputed his works to us. His, his righteousness to our account. 
Titus 3, 6, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. And next we read in, in verse 7, Titus 3, 7, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs. God makes us heirs. It's not something we earn. It's not something we do. He makes us heirs according to the hope of eternal life. If the Bible gives you the hope of eternal life, then you've been made an heir. Anyway, now, if you compare this verse, uh, Titus 3, 7, compare it with Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, to clarify the meaning of Romans 8, 17. This in Titus here, 3, 7, is a specific statement. Look at uh, Romans 8, 16, 17, and 18. The Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children... Lost my place, just a second. And if children, then heirs, semicolon, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, semicolon again. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Verse 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. If the clause in Romans 8, 17 says, the, where, where it says this, uh, if so be that we suffer with him, if that clause applies to being joint heirs with Christ just before it, uh, just before the semicolon, which says that the following statement explains it, uh, if it applies to joint heirs with Christ, then it also has to apply to heirs of God in that same section, in the same verse. Uh, if we're only heirs of God up upon certain conditions, then Titus 3.7 is a lie. But that supposition is a falsehood because God can't lie. We can count on him. Um, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs, made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Well, in Romans 15, Paul does not yet claim to have been sent to all the Gentiles with the gospel of Christ. Uh, the gospel of the grace of God. But in Romans 15, 16, Paul is telling information from God, from, from Christ's temple vision to him, telling him that he would soon be sent to all men. It wasn't there yet, but it was coming soon, in other words. He, he's telling these people that he should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. That's uh, Romans 15, 16, 15, verse 16. It was something that was yet to happen. Paul is saying, I should be, I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. At that time, it was still future that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, directly to God, acceptable. Not having to go through channels, not having to go through a nation or through Israel. Most probably, Paul had that temple vision in Acts 18, verse 22. A couple chapters earlier than when Romans was written in Acts 20. The temple vision was when Christ told Paul that in the future he will send him far hence to the far off Gentiles. The ones identified in, in uh Ephesians 2, verse 13 and verse 17. And when and here's, here's that verse that tells his visit to, uh, to the temple in Jerusalem. When he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. 
Paul later tells how it happened in, in Acts 22, verses 17 to 22. And you can see why it's such a short verse, his, his fourth visit to Jerusalem. Let's look at those verses, starting in verse 17 of Acts 22. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem. So he had just given this story of his conversion on the Damascus Road. And so he starts off here and he says, he said, it, it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem. So it's a different account, in other words. Even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And I saw him saying unto me, Make haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. Verse 19, And I said, Lord, they know that I am prison and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. And he was reported, Paul was reporting this before uh, the police or the, the uh, I don't know what you would call them, constables, the, the, the law. The Jewish, would be Pharisees and, and uh, people like that, uh, we can look up exactly who it was, but they had authority because they gave him audience, they heard him until this word far hence unto the Gentiles, the Goyim, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. They wanted to kill him. Now they knew about the Greeks and the Gentiles that came to the synagogues and blessed Israel. But this is different, obviously, from the reaction. These are not those uh, Greeks that he's talking about, the Gentiles, far hence to the Gentiles. They were the far-off Gentiles. The epistle, you know, uh, <laughs> it's amazing all the information that that's in this. But uh, in this epistle, in different areas, both, both salvation, Christian living, what happened to Israel, uh, how to how to you know your your daily walk and the uh, the instances uh, situations you come into, and then here he he talks just having talked about peaceful edif edifying of each other, he talks about what's coming up. He's he's uh, he's given them the whole counsel of God that was do for them that he was charged with giving them but now he's being sent out on on something different something more paul was most probably sent the second time in acts 20 verse 6 and the the epistle to the romans was written three verses earlier in acts 20 verse 3 jesus christ sent paul to go to all men and to preach the gospel of salvation directly to all men without any covenants, uh, any nation of Israel, any blessing, uh, any works. Christ's sending of Paul was no longer limited to the Jews and the Greeks in the synagogues. In a position to those Jews and Greeks, they were in a position to provoke the apostate Israel into to jealousy Israel was undergoing a diminishing that was in that same period the period there between Acts uh, 2 and Acts 28 they they fell during that time and they from the fall on actually that was when it's identified as diminishing at, after the fall in Acts 7. But uh, he was now to go to all men. Even these Ephesians that had not been in the commonwealth of Israel. And so had not been 
in Israel's covenant. It's a promise. So this verse, Romans 15, verse 16, identifies that Paul completed his first sending and is anticipating his immediate or eminent second sending to the far-off Gentiles. It hadn't happened yet by the time he wrote, the, wrote Romans in Acts 20, verse 3. He, he doesn't have inside information as to when it's going to happen, uh, but he knows that he's completed his first sending. By that, he knows that his second sending to all men must be imminent, must be coming soon. And because of that, Paul could write Romans 1, verses 5, and 14. Romans 1 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for the obedience uh, to the faith of among all nations for his name. So he he knew he was to be sent to all all nations. He's got that apostleship already. Uh, that would be in Acts 20, verse 3, when he wrote this. And going down to Romans 1, 14, I am, a, a, I am debtor both to the Greeks, well, he had been to them, but then he goes on, and to the barbarians. Uh, he hadn't been sent to them yet uh, un until he's just announcing it now. Both to the wise and to the unwise. Remember, the Greeks were the ones that sought the wisdom. They were wise. They sought the wisdom of God. As we know in Acts 20, verse 6, Paul left Macedonia, and that was what he later identifies in Philippians 4, 15 as being the beginning of the gospel. It was the beginning of the gospel of the grace of God. It was not called that before that time. It was the same saving message in that gospel as Paul had preached earlier to the Jews and the Greeks. It was the same means of coming to God, but now it was sent to different people, to uh, all people, to all men from then on. The conditions of that gospel were different from Paul's earlier gospel of Christ, although it was the same saving message. We need to keep saying that so people understand it wasn't a different way to be saved. It was a wider audience of people, of recipients of that gospel that, were, that Paul was actually sent to. He could have preached to whoever he wanted, but his sending is who he writes. You know, he writes with that authority of being sent during those uh, Acts epistles. The recipients of the sending were what was different. They included all men instead of just the Jews and the Jew blessers, called the Greeks often in, in the King James. Different recipients constitutes different conditions, meaning it became a different gospel with the same saving message. When Paul was initially separated to the gospel of God, Paul was then called and sent to what the Bible calls the work, preaching the gospel of Christ. Paul was told in, a, I, I, I don't want to confuse that. I left something out of my notes there. Um, the work is a prophetic thing. Paul was the, the uh, Paul's preaching was the answer to that, those prophecies. It was not, he was not in prophecy. Paul, neither Paul nor his gospel nor the body of Christ are anywhere in prophecy from, well, from Genesis 3 or, e or even before. <laughs> from early in Genesis all the way through, uh, through the end of prophecy, the body of Christ is not mentioned through, you know, through Acts 8 at least body of Christ and salvation by believing that Christ died for your sins the 12 never preached that Jesus Christ never preached that when he was on earth Paul was called and sent to the work preaching the gospel of Christ 
Paul was told in a vision in the temple that in the future he would be sent far hence to the far off Gentiles. And Paul indicated he knew he had fulfilled his first sending. Paul was waiting, awaiting his second sending, which he got three verses after he wrote Romans. So that's how close the, the timing was. But actually, it was, it was a time gap between when he heard in the temple that he was going to be sent to all people in Acts 18 and in Acts 20 when he was actually sent. And since I don't want to confuse the issue, let me just say that the blood of Christ was sufficient to save anybody even before Paul's second sending, anybody that would believe that Christ died for their sins. Uh, they could have believed on Christ to have died for their sins to save them if they would have heard the gospel message and believed it. But they had not heard and believed that message yet because Paul had not yet been sent to preach it to them. But, you know, there are incidental things. They had relatives maybe that had heard it and they heard, uh, who knows, uh, the Bible doesn't specify how uh, some of those things worked. Paul still had been sent to the Acts remnant first, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, the Jew blesser, with the gospel of Christ, it was called then. The power of God unto salvation. You know, <laughs> think about that. I mean, we say it over and over, but God is powerful so that by his word, he created the universe. And it says here, the power of God unto salvation is the gospel of Christ. But Paul had a sequence in preaching the gospel. Uh, you can see it right in the first chapter of Romans. If you look at Romans 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. First he preached the gospel of God. Romans fifteen sixteen, ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable. After the gospel of God, then Paul preached the gospel of Christ. And you see down further in chapter 1 of Romans, verse 16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And we're about to close here, but uh, after his second sending, it was called, that same gospel was called, the gospel of Christ was called the gospel of the grace of God. And later yet, Paul revealed in 2 Timothy 4, verse 17, that it was to all the Gentiles, not just the Gentiles, Gentiles that would provoke Israel to jealousy. No, this was, his second sending was to all the Gentiles. And we are glad that he was sent and uh, that he was not uh, unfaithful to that sending. Because that was uh, back in our history, in our, would you call it history? And uh, spiritual ancestry? I don't know. Uh, but that's how, you know, Paul wrote. Without Paul, we would have no way of, of knowing that we could be saved by believing that Christ died for our sins and not working for it. Uh, we wouldn't know. It's not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or in Acts 1 to 8, or in Hebrews to Revelation, or in the Old Testament. It's not there. You have to go to Paul. There you go. All right, just looking in. Uh, it, we're done. Uh, so if you have questions or comments, please bring them up.